Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're here to talk about Demodex blepharitis. And as we all know, Demodex blepharitis, treatment, diagnosis, identifying patients, it really takes a group effort, um, a team effort. And so we're joined by an all-star cast uh, of people who really are integral to uh, the management of patients with demodex blepharitis. So I uh, would like to start out with some introductions. My name is Marjan Farid. I do cornea and cataract surgery at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute at UC Irvine. We're joined by uh, Eric, Dr. Eric Donenfeld, who is from Ophthalmic Consultants of Long Island Vision. Uh, Dr. Paul Karpecki from Kentucky Eye Institute. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Dunn, PharmD from Cooperative Benefits Group. We have Derek Sterling, COA from the KTND Ophthalmology Associates. And we will also be joined by a patient, uh, Mr. Dermot Ryan. Um, we're very um, happy to be having a per patient perspective um, when it comes to demodex blepharitis. It really is a journey for the patients and there is a lot of uh, morbidity um, that goes along with having this demodex blepharitis. So it's really a unique perspective to hear from the patient and what they have to go through um, to get treatment. So we'll jump right in. And we really want to start out with what is demodex blepharitis? Um, you know, how is it diagnosed? What is it? Who is really impacted? And maybe I'll jump right to our um, infamous Dr. Eric Donenfeld. Um, to get a little bit of background on demodex blepharitis. Well, Marjan, um, what we all know is that demodex is extraordinarily common. As a matter of fact, it's it's almost every patient has demodex. It's um, a very common common mite. There are two different varieties. One lives in the lashes. Uh, that's demodex folicularum, and then there's demodex bluff, um, brevis, which lives in the meibomian glands. And what we know is that Demodex is very common. And what we did not know until recently was the profound effect that Demodex blepharitis has on patients' quality of life, lid margin disease, and ocular surface disease. And Demodex, uh, again, is a mite, and it lives at the base of the lashes. It, its excrement, its inflammatory process causes the presence of small collarettes, which are little elevations uh, of material at the base of the lashes. And what's nice about that, if you can say it's nice about that, is that it's absolutely pathognomonic that when you see these collarettes, you 100% know that the patient is infected with Demodex. And what we look for is not just one Demodex collarette, but what we see constantly now that we look for it is we see patients whose lids are just completely covered with these collarettes and these patients overwhelmingly will have itching, and the itching will be in the lids. Uh, they'll have crusting, they'll have erythema, and they have chronic disease, and almost always they've been misdiagnosed. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, we used to think you have to pluck an eyelash and look at it under the microscope to see the mites, but we've really recognized that you don't need to do that. You don't really need high fancy te uh, technology. If you have patients look down, you can really see these collarettes uh, very visibly at the base of the lashes. The key is to have patients look down. And I've made it part of my regular routine when I examine patients as part of my general eye health exam is to make sure I have patients look down and, and look for collarettes at the base of the lashes and found that it's really so much more common than I previously thought. Uh, most of us have a few collarettes, uh, but many of us have a lot. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing that those patients that we had seen with ocular surface um, symptoms, discomfort, pain, irritation, really, if you have them look down, many of these patients have uh, an overgrowth of these uh, mites and, and increased cholerets. Paul, let me ask you, is there a specific demographic that we see demodex blepharitis in more or what is the patient population? That's a very important question. Uh, you know, I think over the years of managing this condition, I always felt like we had a little more with the elderly. As you age, you saw a little slight increase. But 
As we started researching and looking at it more carefully, uh, we start to recognize that there really isn't any specific age category that's that there may be some that are more affected, as in elderly patients, we have a little bit more, maybe someone in their 70s has more than someone in their 40s, but it doesn't exclude the fact that it can affect any age, children. Uh, it's routinely, I've seen patients come in with multiple horiola or recurrent horiola, only to find out that, yeah, they had demodex blepharitis, so they were seven or, or nine. You know, so we, we are aware of it at every age category. And then, of course, it increases, I think, over time. There are other subgroups where I feel like I'm seeing more of it, such as patients who suffer from rosacea, dermatological or even ocular rosacea seems to be a little higher. But then if you look at some of the studies, like the Titan study out there, it, it's almost an all-comers type of disease, meaning that whoever shows up, whether they're for a regular eye exam, for a cataract eval, glaucoma patients, contact lenses, or dry eye, there's a large percentage of that population in any one of those categories that has demodex blepharitis. So it has uh, very little to do with socioeconomic. It really, uh, we're aware of, there's no issue or association there. It's uh, it's an all, you know, equal opportunity might. If you're very affluent or or you're you're not, it doesn't matter. It, it's present. And so it's it's one of those conditions that I think there may be a predilection to age a little or to certain races, but it is fairly ubiquitous across the population. <music> 